Okay, thanks for coming back to Shooting It Straight and to another segment of Frequently Asked Questions where viewers, associates, former associates, friends, and family members have asked for my opinions and or comments relating to the world of defensive shooting, guns in general, ammo in general, and so forth. And I'm pleasantly surprised to see that my Frequently Asked Questions video segments have been somewhat popular at least so far anyway. And of course, um, as Paul Harrell says, uh, my opinions are based on my experiences, my training, my education, my research, and some established facts. Now, I'm certainly no expert, but there is a chance that somebody somewhere could learn something from these segments, including myself, so I continue to put them out. I'd like to, uh, right now, though, extend a sincere welcome to the several new subscribers to this channel. Boys, I hope you find some good, useful information in my videos. My channel is meant to help you become better prepared for a deadly force encounter by putting forth factual information and proven techniques. I'd also like to uh, thank all subscribers that have left comments. I haven't had a lot of them, but I have found them all to be very intelligent and very considerate. And what a uh, few disagreements expressed by viewers have, I think, all been logical, reasonable, professional, and thought-provoking. Now, my subscription group is small, but obviously intelligent and mature, okay? And I don't have any of those keyboard commandos here. So I just wanted to thank you all for that. Okay. All right. Now, let's uh, dive right into all this uh, frequently asked questions. And the first of it, and I wrote it down so I could see it better, is... Uh, what do you think is the best subcompact EDC on the market today? Well, none. <laughs> okay, now that's just my own opinion, all right? But, you know, I'm just not into cute little subcompacts and micro handguns, especially as an EDC. Now, I think they're fine for infrequent events that might require you to dress up in a tuxedo or something. But really, if you knew you were going into a gunfight, is that the handgun you want to have with you? Not me, okay? I want a handgun that's built for the battlefield. How many cops carry a micro gun in their duty holster? None of them do, and for good reason. You know, I don't, um, I don't choose a, a, an EDC because it's cute, or because it's easy to carry. I choose one based on its reputation for reliability, durability, and controllability. A handgun built for the battlefield will be large enough for you to get all fingers on the grip for better control, and you'll be more accurate with it that way. And it will have a lesser chance of malfunctioning. Uh, something similar to a Glock 19, for example, satisfies those requirements and is just about the perfect size for almost any concealed carry occasion. Although, I do think that the Hellcat Pro, in the standard size, uh, would also be a worthy option, okay? But anything smaller than that should just, uh, just be carried in your purse. Put them... Okay, I'm just kidding. Don't get all crazy on me. Okay, uh, let's see. If bigger, what, what's that say? If bigger holes cause more damage and blood loss, and the unexpanded diameter of the 45 ACP is a lot bigger than the unexpanded diameter of a 9 millimeter. Shouldn't the U.S. military switch back to the bigger 45 ACP since the Geneva Convention bans the use of hollow point ammo in war? Okay, listen. 
I can't count how many times I've heard and read this bullshit about the Geneva Convention, so let's just put this to rest. But now first, understand that the handgun is not a big priority for our military, nor is it a big priority for any other military, because it is mainly a secondary weapon. Uh, and, uh, you know, secondly, let me get this right. Secondly, the Geneva Convention has nothing to do with ammunition used in firearms during warfare. In fact, it's not mentioned anywhere in those documents at all. Now, I believe that what happens is that most people get the Geneva Convention confused with a provision in the 1899 Hague Declaration. Okay, the 1899 Hague, H-A-G-U-E Declaration, outlining a legally binding international agreement prohibiting the use of explosive bullets or expanding bullets. In other words, expanding bullets being hollow points uh, during, during international warfare. Now, that's found in provision three or four of the document. I can't recall which, but it's in provision three or four of that uh, Hague document. Now, what most people don't understand, including many veterans, is that the United States never was and is still not legally bound by this part of the declaration or provision because we refused to sign on to it all those years ago. In fact, <clears throat> section 6.5.4.4 of the Department of Defense manual says, and I'm quoting here, the law of war does not prohibit the use of bullets that expand or flatten easily in the human body. End quote. The 1899 Hague Declaration was developed as a humanitarian effort to prohibit the use of bullets that were designed and calculated to cause superfluous injury. The U.S. Department of Defense manual goes on to provide three reasons why expanding bullets, hollow points, are lawful to use in military conflicts. One, the 1899 Declaration on, Expl on Expanding Bullets, quote, only creates obligations for parties to the Declaration in international armed conflicts in which all parties to the conflict are also parties to the Declaration. And the United States is not a party to the Declaration. And two, Expanding bullets, especially modern ones, are not inherently inhumane or needlessly cruel. And three, the 1899 Hague Declaration does not reflect customary international law. Now for these, these reasons, and a few more, the United States refused to be a part of the Declaration when it was presented at the 1899 Peace Conference. At the time, the American representative, Captain William Crozier, C-R-O-Z-I-E, stated that the declaration was nonsense and the United States refused to sign the agreement. The declaration was widely viewed as the result of a sensationalized German study on expanding bullets, combined with political and military motivations from Britain's European rivals. Okay, so, uh, you know, in other words, it was a political stunt to gain military advantages, is what it was seen as. At least as far as the United States was concerned. Thus, the United States military was never truly prohibited by any international law from using hollow point or expanding bullets. And we've been using hollow point ammo for many, many years in certain military operations and certain activities. Now, while it is true that FMJ ammo is the traditional ammo supplied and used by the average soldiers in our military conflict, it is not due to any international law constraints. All right, 
is mostly due to its superior penetration ability, the ability its, its ability to penetrate, which is absolutely vital in a battlefield. Now, to address the issue of the U.S. switching back to the 45, the United States military went with a 9mm not because the military thought it was just as good as the 45, but instead because the 9mm is a NATO round and it's less expensive than the 45, whereas the 45 ACP was never a NATO round, and because of that it limited the access to that ammo around the world. Now my personal opinion is that since the handgun is not a primary weapon in the military except for certain assignments and the fact that you know and most of you know that NATO ammo is usually loaded a bit hotter than the commercially available ammo anyway. I see I don't see any reason for the military to switch back to the 45 ACP at this point. Okay. Oh boy. <laughs> Alright, what do you think about Glock's new flat face performance trigger? Uh, well, I'm always in favor of more choices and alternatives. Now, I haven't had my hands on one of those triggers yet, and really, you know, quite frankly, I really don't care to. Uh, from what I understand, it's basically just a Timony aftermarket trigger. Yeah, it'll shave off about two pounds from the factory trigger pull, but as a concealed carrier, you don't want a light trigger pull. Five to six pounds is just about optimum. Uh, anything lighter than that is just asking for trouble in the form of accidental or negligent discharges. And, you know... Personally, I've never understood the widespread salivation for something so meritless as a flat face trigger shoe as opposed to the standard, you know, curved factory trigger shoe. I just don't see any advantage, and I think it's just another tactical thing. Uh, really, there's absolutely no need to change out the factory trigger on any Glock. I can only guess that Glock finally caved into this consumer fad or realized the opportunity to cash in on the tactical trigger market. As for me, well, I'll pass on getting a new trigger, thank you, because I'm not one of those trigger queens that needs a delicate trigger. Don't you just love my FUD attitude? Oh, help me, Lord. Okay, I've heard people say that some, gun, some guns are more flat shooting than others, but doesn't the term flat shooting refer to bullet trajectory? How can the gun itself be flat shooting? Okay, well, I can appreciate the confusion here. Flat shooting generally does refer to bullet flight or trajectory or or how long the bullet can maintain a relatively straight or flat flight path, you know, before gravity causes it to begin to deviate from your original point of aim and affect your shot placement to any significant degree. Now I stress relatively straight path because actually the bullet begins to drop the second it leaves the barrel of a horizontally held gun. Now that initial drop is far too minuscule to measure until many meters out. But, you know, I don't want this to turn into a discussion concerning ex external and transitional ballistics like bullet trajectory and the, the variables involved, uh, near zero and far zero, or bullet drop with maximum point blank range and battle zero and so forth. You know, it's all, uh, it's all uh, very, it's all a very technical topic, so I'll just leave it at that since bullet flight and trajectory really has no relevance to personal close distance self-defense shooting because the distances involved here is far too short for these things to come into play, so they really don't apply to that. 
Uh, however, the, the term flat shooting has also more recently been described or been used to describe a particular gun that tends to have less muzzle rise than other guns when firing the same caliber and the same loads. Now, this concerns the gun itself, not bullet flight or trajectory. And this is usually due to the design of the gun itself, such as its mass and the way that that mass is distributed and the location of the uh, bore's axis in relation to the hand gripping the gun. Uh, for example, I can tell you that the Walther PPQ and 40 caliber and the HK BP40 uh, will have just a bit more snap and muzzle rise than this Glock 22, mainly due to their higher bore axis. Now, I won't say that the Glock 22 shoots flat because it doesn't, but it is more flat shooting or less muzzle rise than the other two when shooting the same loads and the same caliber simply because the grip angle right here brings the bore the bore axis down lower and more in line with the shooter's hand so it absorbs more recoil that way and has less muzzle flip than most others so design does that okay <clears throat> is there a difference between a double tap and a controlled pair, or is it all the same? Yes. And no. <laughs> okay, a, 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 a double tap is two rapid shots fired as fast as possible. I mean, just as fast as you can pull that trigger. Bang, bang. Right? Now, this is only for very close defensive shooting because here, you're not concerned about allowing the front sight to get back on target before firing off shot number two. Thus, that second shot will probably be a little higher because you're still in recoil during shot number two. Again, though, this is fine if the distance is very close, within a few feet. For further, further out, you know, uh, further away, a controlled pair which is also two shots, but with a controlled pair, you wait for the front sight to fall back onto the target before letting shot number two go. Okay, you shoot, you go into recoil, you wait for that front sight to drop back down on target before you fire shot number two, right? Now this is usually at distances of more than several feet where you need to be more accurate. The actual situation itself and the distances involved should should determine which of these two methods you use. Okay. Why don't you have any... What the hell? Why don't you have any cool tattoos on your arms like the other YouTube gun gurus? <laughs> well, uh, number one, I'm not a gun guru. Uh, but number two, I mean, think about it. Would you put a bumper sticker on a Rolls Royce? No. So I'm not going to put tats on me. Gabish. I know, I know. And the last one is, why do you prefer the 45 ACP over the popular, or the more popular 9mm? Well, because I'm lazy and I don't want to have to shoot more than once. Yeah, I said it. <laughs> okay boys um, we're going to wrap that this segment up I hope I was able to answer some questions or perhaps shed some light on some things for you you know I really do appreciate you watching my videos and helping this little channel to grow at least just a little bit so again thanks for watching I'm Antonius and I promise I'll keep shooting it straight with you ciao